All right. Good afternoon. Uh, we see some folks are joining us today, and we welcome you. We're happy to have you for today's installment of Adventures in Field Research Virtual Seminar Series. Uh, today, we are very pleased to, to welcome Dr. Stephen Nowicki from Duke University. He's going to tell us, share some of his adventures that he's had uh, related to field work. And I think it's an interesting title here, Adventures with a Robotic Bird in a Marsh. So we'll see what we're up for with this one. I do want to remind everyone at the end, uh, there will be an opportunity for discussion and questions. If you fear that you'll forget your question, uh, you can take advantage of the chat box at the bottom to preserve that question and we'll get to it at the end. So with that, I'll turn this over to Dr. Nowicki. All right, thanks very much. Let me share my screen. Um, first of all, I really wanna thank uh, uh, Adam for inviting me. Uh, this is um, a really fun idea. And um, I've, I've actually never been to Lincoln Memorial, but I've heard about it for years. And maybe I'll get there post COVID to, to see it in person. So this is actually particularly nice to have a chance to talk to some folks there. Um, wh what I wanna do is begin by telling you what I think some key points I wanna make out of this are, uh, and it's about field research, but um, sort of the overarching things that I was thinking about was the importance of discovery through being in the field. And, and I'll tell you about the discovery, broadly speaking, you know, sort of you see things when you allow yourself to just spend time in the field. And then there's the challenge and the fun of figuring out how to test ideas in the field. Um, uh, and then, you know, uh, this is not so much about field work. I think it's about everything, but it's the importance of teamwork. Um, and you'll see what I mean by that. So these are the overarching big pictures that I want to get out. Uh, this opening picture is a picture of me walking on a burn that's separating two pieces of the marsh I work on. Um, I'll show you some other pictures of the marsh as we go along. I want to begin with that idea of just watching or, or spending a lot of time. So I'm going to play you the video. Now, it could be that this, and this is not a professional video, this is just stuff we've taken, and it might be kind of laggy on Zoom, and I apologize for that. Sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. This is a song sparrow, and um, and you may be familiar, a very common bird. Um, this bird, and when you see this video, is going to be doing two things that I hadn't noticed, even though I had worked on this bird for more than a decade when we first came across this. And I hadn't noticed because it's kind of subtle. So, you know, birds sing, they sing very loudly. Uh, you know, typically, a, a, you know, a song sparrow might be singing as much as 90 dB, which is about the, so, the, the, the loudness of if you're like standing right next to a power lawnmower, um, or if you're maybe 10 or so yards away from a motorcycle. So these guys are really loud. So what you're gonna see is that its beak is moving and it's, you can barely hear the song because in this case, it's singing very softly. Now you'll hear a song in this, and that's a song that I'm playing from a loudspeaker, right? The loud song is me, the bird is responding very softly. And you'll also see, and I hope you can see this in this video, it's flipping its wing, you know? And, and you have to kind of look close to see this because these are subtle signals, uh, but see if you can see it. So let me play this for you. Oh, and now he's gone down and there's a mount I put and bam, he attacks it pretty viciously, going for the eyes. All right, so, you know, that's, that's the observation. You know, I'll change to the next, oops, I don't want to explain it again, sorry. Let's go to the next slide. So as I said, I'd studied these birds for, you know, well over a decade. And it was only when we decided to like get a microphone up close and take a close look that we noticed that they were making these really soft songs and that that wing flick, right? You know, what is that about? Now, that particular video, you know, showed the animal giving those behaviors and then it swoops down and it attacks a taxidermic mount. So it's making these very subtle, um, potentially signals that it's about to attack uh, and then it attacks. So, so that was sort of the observation. 
you know, are these are these really subtle signals, signals of aggressive intention or aggressive intent, you know, a warning that I'm about to attack you? So there are going to be two species in this talk, right? This is a song sparrow. Here is a swamp sparrow. By the way, you'll see Rob Lachlan's name all over these. He's a, he's a former postdoc who is a great scientist and also an incredible nature photographer. So they're closely related um, species, and we're going to be talking about both of them. I'm going to talk about the song sparrow first because that's where we came across it. And then I'm going to switch and talk about the swamp sparrow because that's where we actually were able to kind of figure it out. And you'll see how that goes. All right. First, a little background about where we do this field work. This is a screenshot of a Google map of northwestern and uh, northeastern, northwestern Pennsylvania and northeastern um, Ohio, sort of maybe an hour and a half north of Pittsburgh. That little star right there is the lab where we work. Um, and what's interesting about it is that this area has a really large contiguous marshland, Pimatuning Marsh, also sometimes known as Conneaut Marsh. All right, here's an aerial view of part of that marsh. Um, this is taken from a drone. And, you know, it's really an extensive marshland. Most of that green area showing here, except for the tree area, is actually wet, right? I mean, these are just emergent vegetation. There's some open water areas as well. That cut that's going through, by the way, is a former piece of um, an extension canal from the Erie Canal, if you know those days. Now just overgrown, but they were cutting it through this wetlands because it was easier to do than some of the other places. Here's a little bit more of a close-up view of this. Um, uh, the, the drone is coming down and again you can see most of this is water. You'd have to walk with um, hip waders through this a and in fact if you're not careful and you find a little pothole you might go in over your head. Um, now, this area also has these upland areas around it, right? So this, these are what we call old fields. Um, uh, you know, so this would be where the song sparrows are living in the drier areas, although they'll also live in the marshland. So here's where the swamp sparrows would be living in these kinds of emergent cattail marsh parts. There are parts of this that are open water. I just like this picture because it's sort of on a walk home from one of my field sites and um, uh, three times out of 10, you'll see uh, a bald eagle or two um, nest or hanging out in one of those uh, trees in the swampy part. All right, so a little bit of a close up right now where that um, uh, spot was. The Conneaut Marsh extends mostly to the east of this big lake called Pimatuning Lake. Pimatuning Lake is actually a man made lake, it's a reservoir. And then right here at the edge of the lake is a, uh, a, a place called the Pima Tuning Laboratory of Ecology. It's run by the University of Pittsburgh. It's a small place. If you're interested in summer field courses, that's mostly what they do. They had to cancel them last summer and this summer as well because of the pandemic. But um, if you're looking for an interesting place to take summer field biology courses, this is really a fabulous spot. Here's an aerial view of part of the lab. Um, you can see here the dining hall and some housing. Um, there's cabins located back in the woods. And then um, uh, this is the view from the cabin I usually stay in. One of the joys of field biology. This is a pretty nice, pretty nice place. And you do see also uh, bald eagles flying back and forth across the lake here. Okay, Let's get, let me give you a little background um, that I think will help you understand this talk. So um, I wanna make sure that uh, you understand what this picture that we call a sound spectrogram or, or sound spectrograph or sonogram is what's sometimes called of a bird song. Cause I'm gonna be showing you some of these, right? So here's a song sparrow and here's a sound spectrograph of a song sparrow song. I don't know how this thing goes down or what, but, but you can see the way you read a spectrogram is time goes from left to right on the X axis. Uh, frequency, what we hear as pitch goes from low to high on the y-axis. Now I'm gonna play this Song Sparrow song, this actual song. Um, see if you can follow along on the picture here. Kind of hard if you've not looked at these. Let me play it for you in halftime. Uh, excuse me, the, the oh. sound is not coming through. I don't know if there's a oh. mute function, but we do not hear the sound. Thank you, you know what? I'm going to stop sharing the window because I forgot that what I, I have this automatically set. Thank you very much for pointing that out um, on when I'm teaching. Uh, I have to actually tell it to share sound. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, okay, let's get to back to where we were. Whoops. 
There we go. Can you hear this now? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to play that again. Now I'm going to play at half speed. So interestingly, you do read these like a, like a score of music, except it's not constrained by having particular, you know, note length values or pitch values. Interestingly, back over 100 years ago, a ornithologist named F. Schuyler Matthews um, wrote a book. This was before we had all these instrumental techniques where he basically scored all of the bird songs of North America on a Western staff. Sometimes it was easy, sometimes it's pretty weird. If you look at his bobolink, it's, it's way out of control. Uh, but interestingly, he actually transcribed a song sparrow that sang a song pretty similar to this. So, you know, follow along on the, um, on the musical score. Whoops, I'll try to get this. Not exactly, but it gives you an idea of what these sound spectrographs are. And they're basically, you know, composite Fourier transformed information that allows us to make pictures of the sound. Okay, that's one bit of background. A little bit of another bit of background is to remind you that bird song in the North Temperate region is mostly sung by males, not entirely, but mostly. And it has two functions, two audiences really. To females, it acts as a mate attraction signal. And in fact, females will choose mates based on the way they sing um, to some extent. Um, to males, it actually functions as a keep out signal. Uh, and what I mean by that is that it repels rivals from a territory. So it's a territorial marker. All right, so those are the two functions. It's that latter function, the male-male function that we're gonna talk about today. Okay, now a little, one last little bit of um, background. The kind of work we and others have been doing, looking at song in that aggressive function, looking in that context, um, you know, suggested that birds could use their songs in different ways. So I wanna sort of lay that out uh, out of a review that my colleague Bill Searcy and I wrote um, a number of years ago. All right, so here um, on the right of the screen is a male who owns a territory. Below him is a repertoire of three songs he can sing. Now it turns out if it's a song sparrow, they might have a repertoire of 12, in some cases, even 15 songs. So they've got, they've got, a, they've got a quiver of different songs they can sing, right? And that's his repertoire. Those are just three examples. Now let's say, an intruder comes and impinges on his territory. The intruder also will have a repertoire. And there's a point I wanna make, which is that in a population, birds will often share song types. So those two song types by the two song types by the owner and the intruder are pretty much the same. They're shared song types. But then there are also some song types that each one have that they don't share. So those bottom ones are examples of song types that they don't share. Okay, so now the male intruder sings a song, that's an, a, you know, a signal. I'm here, you know, I'm, maybe I wanna take over. The male owner can do a few different things relative to the songs in its repertoire, the way he uses them. He could respond with a match, an exact match. If he has that song in his repertoire, he would match it exactly and, and basically sing back what he heard. Or he could do what we call a repertoire match. A repertoire match means that it's a song they both share but he is not going to use the exact song that was sung, but one that he shares with the bird that he's interacting with, or he could just not match it at all. Now, work has shown in song sparrows and in um, other species that matching to type exactly is the most aggressive signal. If you repertoire match, it's a little less aggressive. And if you don't, if you don't match, it's kind of like appeasement, right? So that's one thing they could do. This is sort of background about singing. Now, all of these are really loud songs. It's what we call broadcast songs, right? Because they're, they're the, those 90 dB songs that are as loud as a lawnmower you're uh, sitting next to. Um, um, they also could do something if they have a repertoire by switching it up differently, right? So they could switch among song types more or less frequently, song type switching. And the idea is if they switch more, that's more aggressive. If they switch less, it's less aggressive. And then, when we recorded up close, we realized they have yet another thing they could do with their song. They could sing a soft song. Now not shown here, but also something that we wondered about is that wing flick, what we call a wing wave. 
Is that something that they could use? Because this is all aggressive signaling. Now, the point of aggressive signaling, I should note, is to avoid getting into a fight, right? In aggressive signaling, the idea is to signal how serious you are about getting into a fight, or maybe how, how good a fighter you are, because there's no point in getting into a fight if you're going to lose. And in fact, there's no point in getting into a fight if you're going to win either, because even if you're going to win that fight, you still might get hurt. You still might get damaged. So it's to the advantage of both parties in a fight to have a signaling system that sort of settles the fight before it actually happens. So that's what these signals are all about in the context of aggression. Okay, now let's go back and ask, what about that soft song? What about that wing wake? Do they actually predict attack? So here's how we did this, right? This is not the paper that I suggested you could read. This is a paper that came before. This is a little bit of a blurry um, screen capture, and I won't show you the video of this, but, but what's shown here is, a, a, and I'm sorry that I, I'm covering up for you the um, text here. I should have moved this farther over to the uh, left, but this says standing taxidermic mount or, or stationary taxidermic mount. Maybe actually I think it says static taxidermic mount. So that's just a stuffed bird, right? A stuffed song sparrow. What we also have is a loudspeaker that's underneath the platform that this stuffed bird is on, right? So that's where we're gonna play songs. And then because we were interested in soft song, we have a microphone that's very up close, right? So that we can record something that we weren't gonna be able to record at some distance. And the way we would do these experiments is as follows, right? We have that set up. And then what we're going to do, and we put that on a, on a known bird's territory, a bird's known territory, we play a few songs to attract the territory owner. This is six songs, one song every 10 seconds. That's just to bring in the territory owner, all right? And then for that first five minutes, we're just recording what the territory owner does, how many loud songs it makes, how many soft songs it makes, if we can record them. Now we're using a parabolic microphone also to, to you know, focus in and get those soft songs, even if the bird isn't next to our loudspeaker. And you know whether it's wing waving, you know, is it song type switching? So we're just getting a baseline of how that particular territorial bird um, uh, is acting when it senses some territorial threat. Okay, then at minute six, we've got that mount covered, right, beforehand, right? So when we just play those songs, the bird might come in. He doesn't see any other bird. He just heard a bird. He came over. Now we reveal the mount. We have a very clever little pulley system where we take off a cover and we start playing songs again for two minutes, 12 songs. That's it. Now we leave the mount, the bird, the, our, our simulated intruder has stopped singing and then we just watch. Now at some point, and we'll stop at 20 minutes if nothing happens, but at some point along the way, that territorial bird may attack the mount, right? And literally, it physically attacks the mount, as you saw in that earlier video. All right. So now we've got a continuous recording up to the attack. And now we look at what did that bird do in the one minute prior to the attack? This is a post hoc analysis. We recorded all of this, right? Now we said, okay, oh, it attacked at some time, say 13 minutes and 20 seconds in. Now, what did it do from 1220 to 1320? And then we ask, is there anything that the bird's doing here off the beginning? that would suggest it's going to be an attacker? And is there anything that the bird is doing here right before it attacks that it suggests it's actually going to attack? Now, the way we do that, by the way, is that not all birds attack. So we also have a number of these trials where we've done where no attack occurred. So what we do is we take the attacking trials and then in a non-attacking trial, we look at that same minute, right? No attack occurred here, but it's that same minute from 1220 to 1320. And the comparison here is to compare the attackers one minute and initial recording and the non-attackers and ask, is there a difference? And if there is a difference, that's suggestive of that difference being something about a signal saying, I'm actually going to attack you. All right, when we look at the data, here's what they look like. I'll just show you this quickly. First of all, the total amount of singing that the bird, oh, and I'm only showing you the data from the minute before the attack because actually the data from the first five minutes didn't show any pattern, right? So how much the bird is singing, this is the territorial bird, doesn't differ between whether the bird does attack or doesn't attack. Whether it matches or not, right? I told you that's, a, that's supposed to be a signal of aggressive and it doesn't matter. I mean, it matches a little bit more if it attacks, but it's not a significant difference. Um, the amount it switches across song types, 
doesn't matter. The attackers and the non-attackers switch the same amount. The amount of soft song does matter, right? So the birds that sing more soft song are much, much more likely to attack. Okay, so that's suggesting that soft song is a signal saying, I'm about to attack you. Interestingly, the wing waving, there's a little trend there, but it's not at all significant. So what do we conclude from this? Well, we conclude in song sparrows that that wing waving can't be a signal because it isn't correlated with any information that, you know, with any outcomes that would matter to the receiver of that signal. But soft song is. Okay. So this is now where we turn to the other protagonist, the swamp sparrow. This, by the way, this swamp sparrow, we would call um, uh, fish blue, orange, red, um, fish before fish and wildlife, uh, the silver band. So, you know, we would ban, we don't, we didn't ban a lot of the birds for this experiment, but mostly we're banding birds so we know who they are. Um, this bird, I'm going to show you another video. Oh, no, I'm going to show you a little more of the habitat. So this is the kind of habitat this bird lives in as it looks like in late April when the birds are first, first coming back. It's pretty cold up there. Uh, there's not much growing in the marsh. Um, if you walked out there, um, you would need hip waders on. And in some of this area, you would need chest waders. It's pretty deep, mucky water. Uh, it grows up pretty quickly. It's often fog bound in the, in, the, um, in the summer early on until the sun burns it off. It's actually quite charming, um, even if it's a little chilly. Later on, when the sun burns it off, this is what that area would look like, say, in late May. The vegetation is still pretty um, low, but it's grown up quite a bit. And then by the time you get into um, late June, this vegetation is going to be over your head. And in fact, you can't work there because you can't see anything once you get into the marsh. By the way, um, this is what it sounds like. Now, this is a recording I made at this spot probably an hour earlier, right? This is sort of a dawn chorus recording. It, it's really a marvelous um, place. Uh, you know, if, <laughs> if you like getting up early in the morning, this is a place to do it, I have to say. And there are a lot of species here. Um, again, I apologize. I should have pushed this over more to the left. This would be a marsh wren, or at least a half a marsh wren. They're very common here. Um, uh, you would hear a lot of green frogs. If you know frogs, you probably heard those twangy, but you know, rubber band things. Those were the green frogs calling. Again, this is the other half of Virginia rail. There were some Virginia rails calling in there. Sorry about the cutoff. Uh, not making sound, but um, uh, garter snakes and other snakes are pretty common in this area. And then, of course, there's the swamp sparrow very common in here. In this particular marsh area, there's probably a, a, a hundred nesting pairs in a give, given summer in a, you know, several kilometer square area that we would work in here. So this is why we were interested in the swamp sparrow, not only because it's a great marsh, but I'm now going to show you a video of a swamp sparrow responding to an aggressive threat. And this bird, if I remember correctly, isn't singing much, but look at what it's doing. It is wing waving like nobody's business. These guys really use that wing wave and it's not a subtle little flick like in the song sparrow, it's a pretty, pretty blatant thing. I mean, so, so we said, all right, well, all right. And, and, and by the way, these guys will also make soft song. So we asked, let's ask in the swamp sparrow, you know, what, what, what's the signal here in the swamp sparrow that matters? So we went out to the marsh. Uh, shown there on the right is uh, Rindy Anderson, who is the first author on the paper about the robot here. Um, the other person is John Prather, another postdoc at the time. Um, so they're out in the marsh. They're just here scoping out um, territories in the marsh. Um, this is still, again, relatively early in the season because they you can because you can see their waistlines. All right, so the same thing, a little harder because now we have to have a platform that we can put on this very wet, marshy area, but a taxidermic mount of a swamp sparrow with a loudspeaker underneath. Um, we reveal that mount, same experimental design as I showed you for the song sparrow, um, where we're looking at what the bird does in the one minute before an attack and comparing that to birds that don't attack for that same one minute in a paired design. 
Let's take a look at those data. All right, as the title suggests, there was a difference here. Oh, I hope I didn't ruin the, the data here anyway. So I'm gonna show you another measure here, which is how close does the bird get to the mount on average, right? This is integrated over the whole test. And not surprisingly, the attackers come in really close. So actually, if there's one behavior, it's not exactly a signal, but if there's one behavior that's indicative of impending actual attack, it's, it's proximity. Um, the number of songs that the birds sing doesn't matter. Um, I'm sorry, this is cut off. The number of soft songs does matter. So that's what we'd expect. You can see this little piece down here that I'm covering up the rest of it. So that's significant. That's what we found in the song sparrows. But take a look at this. This is the wing waves, a highly significant difference. So the, and the, the point is, is that the birds that wing wave more are much, much more likely to attack highly significantly. So in this species, wing waving does seem to be a possible signal of aggressive intent, of the fact that the bird's actually going to attack. This, by the way, is in another experiment. This is a very bold bird that actually got onto a playback speaker and started <laughs> wing waving right on top of it. This is an old fashioned uh, iPod that we would use to carry the songs around. This is the speaker itself. This is a great, this is also by Rob Lachlan, a great picture. Here's the rub. What we've been able to show is that wing waving is correlated with impending aggression. But we have to do one more thing to show that it's actually a signal. And that is we have to show that the receiver of that signal, that is the male that's watching that signal, actually responds to it, right? Because it could be that these guys are just wing waving in a nervous way and then the other bird isn't paying any attention and the only thing that matters is soft song or something else, right? So the way you do that, and the way we did that with soft song is you experimentally manipulate the signal. So for example, with soft song, you'd go out into the field, say with um, song sparrows, much easier to work with, they're on dry ground, and you would actually play them songs at different amplitudes. And the prediction is that when you play them the softer song, the bird that's hearing it is going to have a more appropriate aggressive response, right? If, if, if you're getting a signal saying, I'm about to fight you, right? That response could be a submissive response or it could be an aggressive response, you know, bring it on. But you have to show that the receiver of the response is actually behaving in a, in a predictable fashion when it receives the signal. So that is super easy to do. Well, not super easy, it's pretty easy to do when you're using just songs, because I can record a song and easily in you know some digital program, Audible or, or um, Audacity, change the amplitudes, right? And play back songs in a controlled fashion and show that the birds do or don't respond differently. And in fact, we've done that and they do. They, you know, Birds treat soft song, both song sparrows and swamp sparrows as a more aggressive signal. But how do you do it with a visual signal? How do you do it where you're going to actually control whether the subject is getting a wing wave or a not? That's where the robot comes in, right? That's why you need a robot. That's a lot harder. This is where I wanna introduce David Pieck and Jason Dudley. So David at the time there on the left was a Duke sophomore, an engineering student. Jason on the right is a taxidermist. Actually, I'm not sure he graduated from high school. David on, I'm sorry, David on the left is a really sharp, ambitious, young 19 year old who has this can do attitude and says, sure, I can build you a robot. Jason is, I'm told by the North Carolina Museum of Natural History, the best taxidermist in the state, right? This guy, and so I went to his website and it was fabulous. So I called up Jason and I said, okay, Jason, I need a taxidermied swamp sparrow. Jason says, no problem, swamp sparrows, easy. And you know, he's done all these small birds. I said, but Jason, I need to have it with a robot inside, right? So this was harder for Jason to understand. Meanwhile, on David's side, David said, no problem, I can build you a robot. And I said, but David, you need to build something that will fit inside the cavity of an actual bird skin. So this took a lot of negotiation and a lot of figuring out back and forth between these two people and Rindy Anderson, um, the first author on that study was, was really the go-between to help them work it out. And work it out they did eventually. 
Here it is, that's RoboSparo, as we call it, all right? Here's the inside of RoboSparo. This isn't complete, but David Pieck had to actually build from scratch a stepper motor that was going to actually be able to move fast enough to move the wing in a natural way. We gave David videos of this wing movement. It's really a fast movement. So he had to build his own motor. He wasn't commercially available and he had to build it in a size and shape that fit inside the body cavity of a bird. You can see this is like a little foam enclosure that is going to be what Jason, the taxidermist, puts inside the body of the, the bird. Um, oh, and by the way, did I tell you that most of the metal parts here, except for this copper wire, David Pieck, the sophomore engineer, told me had to be made out of titanium, which is a really expensive metal. And David milled these himself, right? So, I mean, he went from scratch. Uh, anyway, so here's, here's Jason's side, right? Now he's got this really well-prepared bird skin, and this is hard, um, you know, I couldn't even begin to do this, that's going to turn into a good taxidermic model, something that, that Jason, the, the ace taxidermist, would be proud of. And then we have the computer. Okay, so this is a prototype. You can see the, the scotch tape eventually got lost from this, right? This is just figuring out, because basically we needed to have that wing move in a pattern fashion that we could control. So the real computer is just this little chip here. And so this prototype is, is David, you know, figuring out how to wire up this chip in a way that would move the stepper motor in patterns that we could program, okay. Then you have to put it all into the bird. Well, not, 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 the, not the computer, right? The computer can be separate, but you need to get the motor in there. Um, you might notice that there is a lot of Diet Coke and uh, um, uh, Pepsi and Diet Pepsi, I don't know what this is. <laughs> A lot of caffeine was drunk over many days trying to make this work, but work it did eventually. They got it all to fit together, and there was Robo Sparrow in all of its glory. Um, it's fixed to a little piece of wood that's a natural piece of wood from the habitat so that we could kind of carry it around and mount that on a pole in the marsh. Uh, you'll notice here these three micro wires. Again, apologies that I've covered that up. Um, that's how the computer talks to the motor. Right, so barely visible. Here's another view of that, um, of Robo Sparrow. Okay, what did we do with Robo Sparrow? Oh, first I wanna show you Robo Sparrow in action, right? So this is Robo Sparrow. Um, this is not a real test. This was just asked actually after we'd gotten all the data, just sort of taking some video of it. So let's take a look at this. You can see the vegetation is quite high now. It's probably mid June. That voice was Rindy Anderson, by the way. Um, you'll hear her voice in another video later on. I hope that you could see that pretty well. Robo Sparrow is looking a little worse for wear and tear at this point because he's gone through a full field season. Oh, and you might say, why is there a cage around him? Well, here's why there's a cage, right? So here is, again, late in the season, another simpler robot um, that is... All right, action. That's Rindy saying action. Here's the territory owner. He means it. In fact, he gets pretty violent by the end of it. Um, so the reason for the shark cage is that we didn't want to have Robo Sparrow getting torn apart. Uh, and it turns out that with this shark cage around it, the bird still responded pretty well. So now how did we do this experiment? All right, in this case, we wanted to do what we would call a within subjects design. And what I mean by that is we'd have a selection of, of swamp sparrows, 30 territory owners, and we would test each of them twice, a couple of days apart. Once with Robo Sparrow moving and once with Robo Sparrow not moving, right? And it's a pretty straightforward thing. And, and the prediction is that when Robo Sparrow is giving the wing waving, then it should elicit some appropriate 
more aggressive response from the territory owner as opposed to when it's just standing there. That would be evidence or the beginning of evidence that this actually is a signal. So we go out, we get wet in the marsh a lot, we make sure that Robo Sparrow doesn't get wet and we do those tests and here's the data. Oh man, I'm sorry that I um, didn't push this over far enough. But here's the bottom line, right? The proximity, remember I told you that's the best predictor as to whether attack is actually gonna happen. The wing waving birds actually elicited a lot more uh, or had the territory owner come in a lot closer than when the bird was not wing waving. Now over here, sorry, partly covered was an interesting negative result. And that is that the behavior of the test subjects didn't vary depending on whether the bird was wing waving or not. So that what you would see here is that the amount of wing waving by the test subject was not significantly different, whether the, the um, uh, robot was moving or not. Um, and the amount that it was singing um, uh, at all didn't vary. So that was counterintuitive, but here's the evidence that we need to show that the birds are paying attention to wing waving. There's, there's more data that I don't wanna take time to show you that explains why we would get this um, null result here. And it has to do with the proximity factor, right? So this, if you look at this by proximity, and this is something that's in paper, you do see that there's a relationship that would predict that wing waving is um, an aggressive, is perceived as an aggressive signal. Now we're not done yet. And the reason we're not done is that it could be that it's just movement at all that matters, right? That wing waving isn't anything special. It's just that the bird we're testing is responding more to something that moves. And so we had to do another control and we called that the turn motion control. So we have another robot now that does a simpler movement. And basically that movement is just sort of going back and forth. The movement of going back and forth is going through the same duty cycle of movement as the wing waving. In other words, the total amount of movement in both of those treatments is the same, but the wing waving movement is presumably a relevant moving movement, whereas the turning back and forth is not a relevant signal. So the prediction is that when we do that turn motion experiment, then we shouldn't see a difference. And then that will nail it down for us. So here is uh, Robo Sparrow 2, who just does turn motion. I'm sorry that the sound is a little distorted here. So this, this bird is not doing anything special, at least from a signaling point of view, but it's moving as much as the wing waving. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> taxidermy by Jason aside, the robotic elements that went into making the original Robo Sparrow with the wing wave, pretty expensive. We're talking about approaching one and a half thousand dollars. The parts that went into making the turn motion bird, less than 20 bucks. So fortunately, because it was a lot easier to make the bird just go back and forth. We just needed a motor that would turn that thing. So when we do this, now we re repeat the exact same experiment, 30 birds. This was in a subsequent summer, so 30 different birds. Um, uh, uh, a, a, um, uh, a balance, or a, I should say, within subject design where each bird in a counterbalanced way, you know, either seeing the turn motion bird first or the stationary bird first, saw both of them and we asked, how did they respond differently? That's Oh, this is what I want to do. And again, I apologize for the cutoff. You know, I knew this from teaching, but I wasn't sure. How, anyway, I apologize for this. But here, the key, the key result is showing. And that is, there is no difference between the turning bird and the stationary bird as compared to, um, or across that in terms of the distance. So that then is the evidence that shows that wing waving does matter. And again, there's no difference as you'd predict here in any case between the displays of either the um, uh, wing waving display or singing. Okay, so where do we conclude? There's, and I should have put a few words on here, but I didn't. There's a couple of points I wanna make to conclude. From a science point of view, this is actually a pretty interesting study, but it's actually a pretty simple study, right? We had a very basic question. Does this very stereotypic wing movement serve as an aggression signal? And to do that, we had to first show that it correlated with aggression. 
But then importantly, we had to show that the receiver that would be responding to it responded differently. And that's where the robo sparrow came in. That's kind of interesting because we, you know, again, this goes back to the first point, the discovery through observation in the field. You know, who knew that there was this other class of signals, both soft song and wing waving, right? And if you look carefully enough, you see things that actually matter. Now, we haven't done much more with the wing waving, but here's the kind of reason that that could be interested. Um, if you're interested in this from purely an evolutionary bi uh, biology point of view, a behavioral ecology point of view, you now understand that you have to actually look at a suite of signals, not just a single, single signal to understand that signaling system. There's a lot of work that's been done on the underlying mechanisms of birdsong learning and production. There's a lot of birdsong neurobiology, right? Well, now we, we have to ask, you know, how does that wing waving connect up with the neural mechanisms that are associated with singing? Does it at all? How does the bird coordinate that? So that's discovery through observation. Teamwork. Um, I have to say that, you know, um, evidence shows that diverse teams can accomplish things that non-diverse teams can't. In this case, the diversity was the background, right? We had a very ambitious young engineering student who figured out how to, you know, use a, a, a metal lathe to build a motor from scratch out of titanium. Uh, we had a taxidermist who I'm not sure graduated from high school, but was an incredible artist. And, you know, he knew nature deeply. Um, we had my postdoc, Rindy Anderson, who was a great communicator and who had sort of the vision that we could do this and get people working together. Um, all I did was to kind of motivate people and then buy a lot of um, uh, coke to keep them going along the way. Oh, and, and fall in the marsh. Um, so then the last thing I want to say is sort of the challenge and fun of figuring out how you can answer a question in the field. So I'll tell you another story, right? So David, I actually met when he was a first year student in his second semester. And I, this was when we had already published the, the correlative work showing that wing waving correlated with the possibility of an attack. And I was, I was, I was, I was sort of moaning and groaning a little bit about it, right? Um, I was saying, yeah, we can manipulate the soft song, we can do all of that stuff, but you know, how are we going to manipulate motion in a little bird like this, right? You know, maybe in the lab you could use a television, but even there, or, you know, a screen, but even there, you know, you're not going to be able to do it. And I said, you'll never be able to build a robot that could do that. And that's when David said, oh yeah, we could do that, no problem, right? So you know, David, who was an engineer you know, rose to the challenge of figuring out how to make something work in the field. And I'll end by one other thing about, two other things about David. So a quick story about Robo Sparrow, Rindy Anderson. Um, I had gone up to the field site that I showed you a few days earlier to start scoping out territories. Rindy was gonna drive up separately and she was gonna bring Robo Sparrow. And actually it was her husband who was helping her load the car who had stacked up too many boxes and one on top fell off and it was the box that had Robo Sparrow in it and Robo Sparrow stopped working. Fortunately, David was still at school because he was doing some summer project. And so Rindy called David, he came over immediately. He spent about six hours fixing Robo Sparrow and got it to work. Um, David has since gone on to graduate school. What is he studying? Robotics, but not in um, sparrows. I'm pretty sure of that. So anyway, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And um, if there are any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. I'll end sharing screen so I can maybe see you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, it, it's a new one for me, robotic birds. I appreciated learning about that work and bringing together that diverse group of people. Uh, so we, we would love to have some questions here for Dr. Nowicki. Don't be shy. I'll go ahead. I'll lead. Hey, Dr. Nowicki, it's nice to meet you. Um, I, I am so fascinated. Um, I, I have read your titles and uh, just listening to you. Um, how did you get into ornithology? Um, uh -huh. I know you're into neurobiology, 
that how did you you just have so many interests you're like the uh renaissance man well i don't think i'm a renaissance man but thank you for that compliment um uh I would say that uh, random chance had a lot to do with it. So, I mean, in a nutshell, when I went to college, when I was your age, um, I was a music major. Um, you know, I, that's, that's what I wanted to study. And, you know, I had aspirations of becoming a classical musician, getting a job in an orchestra. Um, but I went to a liberal arts college. And at, like any good liberal arts college, they, you know, said, here's a curriculum, you, you know, you can't just study music. We want you to study some social science and some science. And so I had to take some courses in science. Uh, and as a sophomore, I took a biology course. And I took this course because my friends who were interested in science had taken this course and they said, it's really great taught, you know, taught well, the professor's fantastic. So I said, all right, you know, I'll do that one. And it changed my life because it was really well taught. And I had not studied biology uh, since ninth grade, right? So, you know, and, and, and I don't remember that being a very engaging course, mostly dissecting things, and I wasn't very good at it. So that, that's what drew me into biology. What drew me into birdsong was also somewhat random because when I went to graduate school to study behavior and, and um, you know, neuroethology, neurobiology and behavior, um, I was pretty open as to what I'd work on. Um, but the very first project I did in my first semester as a graduate student for a course involved a bird project. So I have to admit, I didn't know, I, I could not have identified a song sparrow for you when I went to graduate school. I couldn't tell you that that's a song sparrow. I, I mean, I remember, I remember once actually outside of my, uh, uh, the house I lived in um, as a first year graduate student, you know, with binoculars staring at this bird in the tree, trying to convince myself that it was actually a song sparrow. So I got into it sort of randomly, but the connection is that um, when I learned that actually you could study birdsong, it really actually connected with my interest in music, with the aesthetic appeal of that, because it is just sort of fun. To, you know, to my money, it's, it's good to do things that you think are important, but it's also good to do things that you enjoy, right? So, you know, I, I have to say, I just love going out into the marsh. And I mean, if, if you heard that, uh, I forget if I had turned the sound on by that time, but you know, the dawn chorus there, it's just, it's just really enchanting. So that's what drew me along. And, you know, questions keep coming up out of curiosity, much of it coming from spending time in the field. Awesome. Thank you. Great question. I'll ask a question. Did you did you have any unexpected uh, interactions or attacks? Did any other species of bird uh, come in or snakes or other animals uh, as you worked with this or people? <laughs> we try to avoid aggressive encounters with the locals. Actually, that part of northwestern Pennsylvania is a very sparsely dense, uh, uh, sparsely populated area. And the state owns a ton of land, not just the marshlands, but a lot of the upland lands. So it's just what they call state game land. So it's, it's, it's surprisingly undeveloped for the, you know, the eastern part of the U.S. And a lot of the people there are Amish, Amish farmers. Um, so you really don't run into a lot of people, you know, and the Amish keep to themselves. Um, swamp sparrows are occasionally attacked by song sparrows. So one of the things we did was choose swamps. So the song sparrows are real generalists. They'll live in a lot of different kinds of habitats, you know, especially in the upland, uh, you know, um, old fields, but they'll also live not right in the, you know, the marshy areas, but on, around the margins of a marsh where there's brushy stuff that's growing and they'll nest in there. And so we went out of our way to avoid find, testing birds where we knew that if there was a song sparrow that had an adjacent territory because they would have come in and, and screwed things up. Uh, but if you get out in the marsh a little bit or get away from where there's more brushy stuff, then, then it's swamp sparrows all the way. And they're pretty much you know, on their own. I mean, the interesting thing about, about, well, animal communication in general is how species just keep to their own channel, right? You know, so, you know, you as a human observer would hear all of that sound going on out there in the marsh. But I tell you, the green frogs are just paying attention to the green frogs and they don't care about anything else. 
it doesn't mean that there aren't interesting problems there to solve because you know, the green frogs only want to hear the green frog, but they've got the cocktail party effect, right? That's a multi-species cocktail party going on out there. So how they sort that out is uh, its own interesting set of questions that people work on. Actually, the humans that, that um, we do interact with, uh, and sometimes it's a little problematic, uh, are the bird watchers. Because as you can imagine, this is actually a great place for bird watching. Um, Sandhill cranes nest in that marsh, right? So, you know, there's a real, if you're a bird watcher, that's one you'd want to have on your life list. And so when we're out there working, um, every once in a while, you know, a car will drive along, you know, the road that's going, you know, over a burn across the marsh and they'll see us out there and they'll wonder what we're doing. Um, so we, we try to avoid places where we can be seen from the road, not because we want to get away with anything. We just don't want to be, you know, like, bothered by a bird watcher because they're always well-intentioned you know and if, and if you're done with the test they're fascinated with what you're doing and you can kind of teach them a little bit of, of animal communication but uh, you don't want them to ask that question in the middle of a test I have a question um, and that would be specific to the robot bird or more broadly with students being involved in research, how do students get involved or how do you get students involved? Do they usually approach you? That is a really good question, Lainey. Um, uh, I have students from Duke and students from other institutions working with me all the time. The students from other institutions will often approach me, you know, they'll send me an email or something. And, um, because I work at Duke, I have to give some priority to Duke students, um, but Duke students, like students at institutions similar to Duke in biology, are more often interested in going into the healthcare professions, more often interested in getting involved in kind of, you know, bench laboratory, uh, cell biology, genetics and genomics. Um, and since we have a major medical center right here, it's right on campus, there's tons of opportunities for those students. So finding a student who's actually interested in field biology is uh, on the rare side. And then every once in a while, I mean, like, was it before the pandemic, it would have been about two years ago, I get an email from a woman, uh, a, a, an undergraduate who's a sophomore at um, the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, India. All right, so that's different. And it turns out that this, her name was Danya Baroth. You know, she had read a paper or two of ours and she had actually written a proposal to a fellowship program that sponsors Indian students coming over and working in American labs for, you know, some, for the summer. And so, you know, Danya worked with us for a summer. Um, for Duke students, we actually have a system that um, actually you guys might want to look into at some point um, because we're trying to port it out. Um, my colleague, Sheila Paddock, is the, in my department is the champion of this. Um, uh, we call it Muser. And what it is, it's, it's, a, it's a computer program, uh, a website mechanism where faculty can load in ideas of projects that students can work on and students can just go there and search around. It's very convenient and sort of say, hey, I'm interested in this, I'm interested in that. Uh, and then what's actually really nice about that is that the initial contact is semi-anonymous. In, in other words, the concern is that the students who are more outgoing or the student who is the student who sat up front in your class or whatever, you know, is going to be the student more likely to be chosen to work in, in your lab. And what Muser does is it kind of uh, anonymizes the first step, right? So it's just the faculty member saying, hey, I could use somebody working on this project. Sometimes they're paid, sometimes they're volunteers, sometimes they're gonna be very independent projects, sometimes gonna be working with, you know, a faculty member or a graduate student. And, um, and, and the student just sort of puts in their interest. And then it's sort of, I mean, it's a little bit like a semi-anonymous dating site, right? You know, you swipe left or you swipe right. I don't think you actually swipe, but so anyway, um, Sheila has got this implemented well at Duke and she's now working with other institutions. Um, I forget that she's working with a college out in California to do this. If you're interested, I could send you Sheila's uh, contact. She, she'd like this to be kind of like a national thing and not that she wants to, you know, it's not, it's not like anybody's making money off of this. This is Sheila's passion, 
to help students get connected up with research. And she had this idea. She was at UMass Amherst when she came up with the idea of Fortune Move to do. Great question. Thank you. I'm curious, did you ever have any, let's say challenging discussions when you were trying to spend, let's say $1,500 building a robot uh, taxidermied bird? Uh, you mean like with the office people saying, why are you spending $1,500 to build a bird? Yes. Uh, not directly. Um, and that's because at the time I had a National Science Foundation grant that was about aggressive signaling. So, you know, this, this you know, to a typical office person, they may say, this seems weird. But, you know, I was getting funded from the National Science Foundation and I had the extra money that allowed me to do this. Um, when David first said we could do this, I thought, okay, it'd be good to get two or three or four of these. And then when the price tag came in, I said, you know what, I'm hoping that one does it. <laughs> And it did. I mean, it uh, Robo Sparrow lasted through that summer when we tested it, and then we were able to get some video footage of it in action, uh, and then it it died. <laughs> so I still have it here, but it isn't working. It's a very expensive paperweight. Yes. Has there been any look at? trade-offs. I mean, if you're a Rambo bird and you're always fighting, maybe you have a larger area, but then, and more resources, but maybe you have more injuries and less ability to reproduce. Yeah, actually, that's all, that's a really good question, Adam. I mean, in other work that we and others have done, it's pretty clear that, that um, birds can take alternative strategies, right? And, and you know the trade-offs would be why you'd have alternative strategies. Because if you're being very aggressive and you have a large territory and you respond very aggressively to potentially intruders, you're spending a lot of energy on that. Um, you know, there's the opportunity cost of the time you're spending on defense. There's the chance that you'll actually have an injury cost. Whereas if you just sort of lay low and stay, uh, you know, as long as I keep enough of a territory, you know, I'll have some reproductive success. Um, so. Um, a former postdoc of mine who's at um, Western Carolina University, Jeremy Hyman, has done a lot of work showing that there are more or less, that there are, there are um, wimps and studs, he calls them, in a population. And interestingly, what Jeremy has also shown is that um, the likelihood of being a wimp or a stud depends on how urban you are, right? Now, Western Carolina is not in a highly urban area. But you know, if you go to a place where it's completely out of the little town that it's in, there are more of the, I think it's more of the, the aggressive birds. And if you go to populations that are more you know, suburban in a little town, because song sparrows is generalist. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you have them on your campus. I would imagine you do. Um, they're, they're pretty widely spread. Um, he found that those tend to be a little bit less aggressive, so. Great. Uh, let, let's allow one additional opportunity. We have a fair number of people in here with us. Uh, do we have any other questions? Well, Rachel, Lane, Caitlin, Jada, Logan, Bailey, Ian, Curtis, and John, thanks for coming. And if you do have questions, you know, shoot me an email. Um, uh, if you look for Steve Nowicki, though, on the web, there is a person named Steve Nowicki who works on behavioral development in humans at Emory. We get confused for each other all the time. You'd think that there would only be one of us in academia, but I've met him. He's a great guy, fortunately. Um, all right. Well, thank, thank you very much. We appreciate lear learning about the work you've done and the, the robo bird. I want to real quickly thank Laney and John who do the uh, bulk of the work to make sure the logistics and, and that this actually happens. Uh, so we appreciate their work in bringing this seminar series to fruition. I also want to put in a bit of a plug uh, to, for everyone to invite a friend, uh, tell, tell someone about this and invite them to the next uh, edition of our seminar series. We are on a break next week, so we'll be back here in two weeks on March 31st, where we'll hear from Derek Lindsay from the Kentucky Natural Lands Trust. And he's gonna give a presentation he calls Grasslands, 
to Wildlands, Adventures, and Stewardship. So that should be uh, very interesting. Also check out Lincoln Memorial University and the School of Mathematics and Sciences on our social media, Facebook and Instagram. And with that, Dr. Nowicki, we want to thank you once again. We want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, you all have a, a great evening. Get, have some adventures, and we'll see you back here in two weeks. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.